Hey, I'm really pleased to welcome you all to the first session of EAGX Virtual. This session follows on from an EA forum post written by John Halstead and Hauke Hillebrand titled Growth and the Case Against Random Easter Development. Following a 20 minute talk by Hauke, we'll move on to a live Q&A session. But now I'd like to introduce our speaker for this session. Hauke Hillebrand is the founder and CEO of Let's Fund, which researches policy solutions to important problems and crowdfunds for solutions that seem especially effective. Previously, he was research associate at the Center for Global Development, where he worked on global cooperation, as well as climate and trade policy. Before that, we worked together at the Center for Effective Altruism. Hauke holds a PhD in cognitive neuroscience from University College London, was a fellow at Harvard University, and has published peer-reviewed papers with more than 200 citations. Here's Hauke. Hi everyone, my name is Hauke Lebrand. I'm going to talk to you today about growth in the case against random Mr. development. And this is based on an effective altruism forum post that I wrote in collaboration with John Halstead. But I should say that this presentation doesn't necessarily reflect John's views. And also I should say that the ideas and material here rely heavily on work by Land Pritchard, who's a professor of economics at Oxford University. So the EA Global Speaker Guidelines tell me that I should remind the audience that I might be wrong in my assertions and highlight the main arguments against my argument. But for clarity's sake and for brevity's sake, I don't excessively hatch my claims throughout. So this epistemic status disclaimer will have to do. All of this is still a bit uncertain and speculative. There's certainly good counter arguments. Don't believe anything you hear from someone on YouTube. So all of this is under the hashtag better wrong than vague, hashtag strong stances, hashtag say wrong things, hashtag big if true, and hashtag correct me if I'm wrong. So please reply to the forum post if you think I'm wrong. But yeah, you can find the full post on the Effective Altruism Forum, and there you'll find all the hedges, qualifications, steel manning, biases, acknowledgements, references, citations, further reading, podcasts, videos, anything really. So check out the Effective Altruism Forum post of this presentation. Right. Okay. The Effective Altruism Global Speaker Guidelines told me to start off the presentation in a lighthearted and humorous way. So this is me. Okay. So randomistic development. What is it? Randomistic development is a form of development economics which promotes interventions that can be tested by randomized control trials. So Bettner distributions against malaria, dewarming, cash transfers, those are prime examples of randomistic development. And it is exemplified by GiveWell, which primarily works in health, and the randomist movement in economics, which primarily works in economic development. So here you can see Duflo, Banerjee, Kramer, the three most popular randomists who just received the Nobel Prize in economics for their work this year. Okay. What are the key claims that I'm making in this presentation? Number one is prominent economists make plausible arguments, which suggest that research on and advocacy for economic growth in low and middle income countries is more cost effective than interventions funded by proponents of randomistic development. The second claim is that the effective altruism community has neglected these arguments and should prioritize engaging with them. Key claim three is improving health is not the best way to increase growth. And key claim four is we can find funding opportunities that help grow economies of low income countries that would be substantially better than GiveWell's top recommended charity. And that would only require a relatively small research effort. So yeah, we wrote this post really to start a conversation and potentially cause a major reorientation within EA. And I should say, I too used to support direct funding of interventions that can be tested by RCTs. But now I think it's suboptimal and um, perhaps people in the EA community should hold off with donating to random Mr. Charities until this discussion is uh, resolved. So what is the case for growth? Why is growth so important? Economic growth explains a substantial fraction of variance in welfare across countries. So here you see that welfare and GDP per capita correlates very strongly. This is from a paper where they constructed a composite measure of welfare that included not only consumption, but also leisure time, inequality, and mortality. And they created the consumption equivalent welfare measure. And you see the correlation is very tight. In fact, it's 0.96. So GDP per capita predicts welfare very well. So what about extreme poverty, one of the most prominent EA cause areas? GDP per capita is strongly correlated with extreme poverty reduction, which is defined as living on less than 190 a day. 
And here on this chart, you see countries that are plotted. Each dot is one country. And you see median income or consumption per person, which correlates very strongly with GDP per capita, usually. And you see that increasing, and so, sorry, on this axis here, you see headcount poverty rate. So how many people within the population live in extreme poverty, less than 190 a day. And you see that increasing median income above a certain level is actually empirically sufficient to eliminate extreme poverty. So above median income of $5,000 per capita, no country has more than 2.5% of their population living in extreme poverty. And you don't need any cash transfers or bed nets to achieve that. All you need to do is grow your economy and then empirically you won't have much extreme poverty. And increasing median per capita income above a certain level is also empirically necessary to eliminate poverty. Because you can see here too that almost no country has pushed 550 a day of poverty below 10% without increasing their median income above $3,500. So that means if you don't grow your economy, then you won't make a large dent in extreme poverty reduction. So life satisfaction, that also correlates very strongly with GDP per capita. Once it is above $20,000, no country has an average life satisfaction score below five on a scale from one to seven. And actually the country, those, those richer countries will do well on most objective and subjective measures of welfare, such as life expectancy, literacy, sanitation, low child mortality, or reduced undernourishment. But almost no country with a GDP per capita less than $3,000 has an average life satisfaction score above five. And it will actually do poorly on most objective and subjective measures of welfare. And this is likely to be causal. So if you want to do the most good, then you ought to figure out how to increase growth, how to increase GDP per capita. But in the effective altruism community, so far, there have been virtually no investigations published on how to do that. Global health and development interventions they do not increase GDP per capita by much. And it is not very plausible, as I'll argue, that things like bed nets, dewarming, HIV education, vaccination reminders, improved cook stoves, cash transfers, and so on, are the most effective way to increase growth. When we look at the huge welfare gains in Asian countries in the second half of the 20th century, like China, Indonesia, Vietnam, and so on, hundreds of millions of people got out of extreme poverty and no serious development economist argues that this was because the governments of these countries supported randomist interventions or aid supported these randomist interventions like dewarming or cash transfers. Like China did not lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty through cash transfers. Right. And yeah, so improving health is not the best way to improve growth. This might strike some people as surprising because it's quite intuitive that health would grow your economy. After all, healthier people can work harder and learn more in school. And where people live longer, they will be incentivized to invest more in education. And someone might expect that better health would lead to, to growth. But actually, according to a recent meta-analysis by David Weil, a professor at Brown, on health and the relationship to economic growth, the evidence for an effect of health causing growth is relatively weak and the high quality studies that there are, they find small or even negative effects of health on growth. So why is that? Why doesn't health boost GDP much? And I think it's helpful to look at the standard models of how countries develop in order to see why that is. So historically, almost all non-poor countries have grown their economies in three steps. First, you have rural to urban migration. So you have unskilled subsistence farmers migrate to cities and start working in factories. And overnight, um, this increases the productivity of these farmers many times over. And in the second step, this very crude simplified model, the manufacturing sector absorbs vast amounts of unskilled labor. So these workers, they need very little human capital they don't need to be educated because the work in the factories is very simple and they do not need to be healthy either because there's just such a surplus of labor in low-income countries that there are always enough healthy people who are very willing to replace sick workers without increasing population health. And then in a third step, you have the manufacturing sector, which exports niche products to the world market to create wealth for the country. So 
the factories find their niche product. Initially, that's often garments. And then they export it to the world market, which can absorb just vast amounts of stuff so that you can create a billion pairs of sneakers. And then you can take that money and invest that capital that you create into, into education and so on. So that then, only then, much later, your economy can move into high productivity services and so on. And this is how almost every country has developed so far. So, of course, this is very simplified, but the main takeaway here really is that health doesn't cause much growth, but growth does cause health, as we've seen. And this is also mentioned in the meta-analysis by David Weil, that improvements in health have indeed been the result of economic growth. So if this is so, then how can we increase growth in order to get health and welfare and so on? And the answer is through growth-friendly policies, such as economic liberalization policies or trade liberalization. But it's not all you know, to the right of the economic spectrum. It's just about economic policy. So it could also be infrastructure spending. It could also be expert-led development and state protection of industry, yeah, which is a bit more, has a bigger role of the state. So let's just look at trade liberalization as an example. So trade liberalization reduces infant mortality to quite a significant extent. It's usually considered to cause growth. And so for instance, one recent natural experiment suggests that the US trade agreement with sub-Saharan African countries in 2000 caused infant mortality to drop by nine percentage points on a country level. And another recent study found that trade liberalization reduced child mortality in 50% of developing countries that, they, that the study looked at. And in most of those countries, child mortality was reduced by more than 20%. So this is big if true. To get to a similar reduction in infant mortality, one would have to distribute many millions and millions of benefits. And this is why many economists claim that trade deals have a much higher benefit cost ratio than global health interventions. Because in contrast to these randomistic development interventions, which have very high costs per person and quite small benefits, trade deals are low or even negative in costs. Negative because you have gains from trade and they have very high benefits. So for a trade deal, you really just need a bunch of paper and political will, but it scales very well. So to see how big the differences are between randomist interventions and preventing large growth decelerations, defined as big structural breaks and the trend of growth of 10 to 30 year episodes, or causing big growth accelerations, which I don't plot here, and we can imagine what would happen if we were to spend $1 billion on the ultra poor graduation approach, which is a randomist intervention similar to cash transfers, very roughly, and which we know very well from, from RCTs, will create a 1.7x return. So if we were to spend $1 billion on that and give it 100 million Ethiopians right now, that would increase GDP per capita by $17 only from a baseline of $800. But if we were to use this billion to prevent growth decelerations, say like the one in Nigeria here, then that will be equivalent to almost a $7,000 cash transfer for every Nigerian. So if you look at the total benefits of causing these accelerations or preventing these decelerations, they're often in the hundreds of billions of dollars in terms of net present value. So that's just this value here multiplied by the population. And so the benefits of growth are huge. Preventing the Nigerian deceleration would be around half a trillion, $500 billion. And remember, you would have a billion dollars to create a growth acceleration of that magnitude or prevent a growth deceleration of that magnitude. So you could hire a bunch of economists to do that. So yeah, the main takeaway here is that preventing these growth decelerations is orders of magnitude more effective than very good randomist interventions. And economics can clearly affect growth and prevent these growth decelerations so that the expected benefits of growth-friendly research and advocacy are much larger than directly funding randomist interventions. And so to get purchase on this intuition, consider that even if you were to take into account the total costs of all economists worldwide, their salaries every year since 1960, that would only cost you around $300 billion. And to be better than the graduation approach, the entire economics profession would only need to avert a single large deceleration 
similar to the one here in Nigeria in 1976 to be more effective than the graduation approach. That would be all that economics would have ever have to do. So <clears throat> what is going on here? I think very many things, but one of the main things is precision bias, perhaps, uh, where we confuse accuracy and precision. Sorry, this is accuracy, this is precision. We conduct ever more elaborate cost-effectiveness analysis to find out like which intervention is better than another through RCTs and so on. But we lose track of the bigger picture and the crucial considerations, as Nick Bostrom calls them. In other words, we don't realize that it's better to be approximately right than precisely wrong. So, because if we zoom out a little bit, we can look at the story of human welfare over time. It's really well illustrated by this graph, where you see world GDP, which is now at 100 trillion over time. And what you see is that until 1800, average human welfare was pretty much stagnant. But after the Industrial Revolution, it shoots up and living standards exploded. And this preceded most development economics, obviously. So this was all the invisible hand, but no economic planning, pretty much. But then after World War II, the development era starts, the development economics era. And we have the end of colonization, and we have the founding of the IMF and the World Bank, other multilaterals, and especially the US providing lots of technical assistance to poorer countries. And overall, we have a concerted effort by economists and states to increase development, to increase growth. And the development era was also like a huge success. Since 1950, human welfare has improved on all objective measures by more than all prior human history combined. So this is the standard Stephen Pinker story that he tells in The Better Angels of Our Nature. So and then the question becomes, if things are working so well, why change tack? Why not broaden and accelerate this process globally and replicate previous successes? And instead of replicating the success, the randomists now ask, among the interventions that we can test with RCT, what is the most impactful? But in the wake of the period with by far the greatest progress in human welfare of all time through growth, uh, this change in strategy is just really difficult to justify. Thank you. Thank you for that talk, Alka. We've already had a whole bunch of questions submitted, so let's kick off. Right, yeah. Are you concerned by the potential negative side effects of economic growth, like greater greenhouse gas emissions, greater consumption of animal products, that kind of thing? Yeah, of course it's concerning, but the alternatives that are often proposed, like to limit growth from the degrowth movement or from the zero growth movement, I don't think they are the answer or anywhere remotely politically tractable. So emissions will rise in developing countries and they have the right to grow their economies and have a lifestyle that is similar to what advanced economies now have in terms of lifestyle. And the answer is definitely not degrowth, but trying to introduce carbon taxes, trying to invent clean energy technology that can sustainably grow economies in emerging markets. That's the way out. So growth has negative side effects, obviously, but those are not solved by not growing economies. Quite the contrary, probably. It's probably better to grow now so that we have more money to counteract the negative externalities from growth. There, there's an interesting paper also by, published on the EA forum by Leopold Aschen. And it's called Existential Risk and Growth for people who are more interested in the existential risk side. On the animal consumption problem, which has been written about under the poor meat eater problem, I think there too, we see that meat demand in emerging economies is just bound to increase. And I think the way out is just to provide, again, clean meat and advanced economies can foster that through clean meat R&D. And generally, there's a paper called The Moral Consequences of Economic Growth. The argument is that everything that we cherish and value, like all the liberal values and enlightened values, they are more prevalent in advanced economies in, uh, that have experienced lots of growth. And I think there too, like when it comes to animal welfare, we just need people to grow and then change their mind that animal welfare is important. And I think that is advanced through education and so on, which is, again, a side effect of growth. Yeah, that is pretty heartening. Do you think that we know what drives growth? And do you think it's even knowable? Because it seems that China and the US have different theories. Maybe we're only relying on cross-country comparisons with too many variables. 
Yeah, I think we do roughly know what causes growth, but this is a debate right now in economics where the randomista movement says that now we don't know any longer what causes growth. It's almost unknowable. And maybe I'm like caricaturing their position uh, a little bit, but they say it's very hard to know what causes growth. And you can read about that in Duflo's recent book, Good Economics for Hard Times. But then other people say we do know what causes growth and from cross-country regressions, which are often caricatured as like totally worthless, we have maybe found, according to Nobel Prize winner Angus Deaton, what causes growth and also perhaps more what stops growth and what leads to growth decelerations. So so I think cross-country regressions have some value, but obviously their value is sometimes overstated and they have, of course, methodological problems. In the forum post, and especially in the appendices, we go a little bit into this new emerging field of growth diagnostics, where unlike in previous years where you had like a standard set of prescriptions, the Washington consensus, you do now look at what are the particular bottlenecks that a country is facing to grow the economies, and then you diagnose it, and then you try to help them. So this is like under the keyword of technical assistance. And so I think In my opinion, I'm a bit against the randomistic take that we do not know at all what causes growth. And certainly Lan Pritchett also says that it's not unknowable why Venezuela is now spiraling into hyperinflation and like in an economic mess. We do really know that their economic policies that they've implemented recently are just very bad. And so this is not outside of the realm of empirical investigation. So... Even if we expect that we know something about this, do you think that individual donors can know that their donation to advocacy can really affect the growth? In particular, you might expect that the private sector and government are already going to have taken the low-hanging fruit, and so there wouldn't be as much left individual donors. I think that's maybe precisely the point, that we should actually be less certain and rest, less risk and ambiguity averse. And so I'm pushing that maybe also a little bit full disclosure with my with my new project Let's Fund, where I'm encouraging normal donors also to give to high risk, high reward giving opportunities in the advocacy and policy research space. And so, yes, it is more risky, but also because the benefits and the upsides are so high, I think it's worth it. But it's also, there are still funding opportunities. It's not like think tanks don't have no capacity to absorb additional funds. And if you see uh, bigger donors, such as the Open Philanthropy Project, they're also funding think tanks like the Center for Global Development, which again, for good disclosures, is my former employer. But yeah, so I think there are giving opportunities. And in the piece, we actually say that even though we don't have like very concrete recommendations for small donors right now, if we were to do like a little bit of research, then we could probably find with relatively little effort, some really good opportunities for small donors. And yeah, I think small donors might want to hold off giving to randomista charities. There's research underway and they can save their money and then give later. So this is about giving now versus giving later until these questions are resolved. So I'm also not saying that. Maybe maybe I'm wrong, but that might be the case. And uh, perhaps we should give to these very robustly good randomist interventions, which, yeah, to be fair, have a huge funding gap. And But we can put a lot of money into GIFT directly. Transnational welfare has a huge funding gap, seemingly infinite. But if I think about EA in 30 years, then I would rather have a small group of donors have funded like really catalytic, really transformational advocacy at first, had a really high upside rather than spending lots of money on these small scale interventions that won't affect growth and won't affect world history by that much. Yeah. So I think people should be more, less risk averse. Yeah. Yeah. We've had a couple of questions on specific kind of high risk, high reward things that people could fund. For example, Brian Kaplan's work on open borders and charter cities. How do you think about those two interventions as things to fund? So yeah, open borders. So I'm a big fan of increasing migration because there there are interesting papers on that also by Land Pritchard. One is called, for people who are interested, Trillion Dollars on the Sidewalk, where he makes the case that by increasing migration, uh, we can unleash these uh, huge welfare gains for people who migrate to advanced economies from emerging economies. And so he gives this interesting example of a, a Nigerian cab driver who migrates to the United States and overnight, uh, just like by orders of magnitude, increases his productivity 
And so, yeah, migration is really good. Now, <clears throat> uh, and this is the, just the standard economic story of that we should not have that many restrictions and people should go where they have that comparative advantage and that will increase growth. But of course, we now also see really worrying backlash, populism and so on, and the rise of populism everywhere, Brexit, Trump, etc. And there are interesting papers by the MIT economist David Otter, who says that increased trade and increased migration does actually increase populism. And he has like interesting causal natural experiments where he can say like, with every thousand dollars of extra goods that are exported to the United States, we'll have like one additional populist voter, one additional Trump vote, and so on. So you can like causally see that this is, this is happening. And obviously it's also very intuitive. And so the answer here is obviously to not stop like trade or stop migration, which has these huge benefits, but perhaps to more slowly face them in so that people can adapt more. And so that like a, a London cab driver, which is often like stereotypically just said to be like a typical Brexit voter because they will lose their job or like they will have face strong competition due to an, a European Uber driver so that they can not face like rapid competition all of a sudden, but you slowly face in migration and you slowly face in trade so that you have more trade and migration in absolute terms. So the area under the curve is higher, but you don't have these sudden shocks to people so that they become populist and so on. So that is one thing about open borders. And then about charter cities, there is an, an organization that works on charter cities. I think they were also on the 80,000 hours podcast at one point. And I think it's interesting. I'm a bit worried that they're like very high costs in terms of like setting up these charter cities. And I think there are lots of people in development economics who are somewhat skeptical. People who advocate for these charter cities seem to have like quite the libertarian bent where policy change is so hard for growth that you just have to completely start from scratch. And yeah, they probably have like very high costs, but maybe they have also high benefits. Obviously, some special economic zones like Hong Kong have done a lot for growth. And yeah, maybe I'm not an expert on this topic, but those are my two cents on it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so I linked to these, in particular your first answer about the difficulty of wanting to help people globally, but then also that causing problem within a country. We're interested to hear about how important it is to ensure that the benefits of growth are shared equally within a country and also globally. Yeah, uh, so that's probably one of the really outstanding questions where it really depends on how much worse off the poorest of the poor, the ultra poor are compared to uh, the people on a median income in a country and also your discount rate. So obviously with cash transfers and other randomness interventions, it's very easy to target the poorest of the poor, even in the poor countries. Whereas with growth interventions, you sort of rely on some sort of like trickle down economics approach, which again has like a maybe like in, in this case, like a worse rep than, than is actually justified because we do see that over the long run, uh, if you grow an economy, then you will have more rule to urban migration, even though at first perhaps like economic policy advocacy will affect people in the upper income strata more so than those in the those lowest bottom decile. And so, yeah, that might be an outstanding question. So if you have very high discount rate, and if you think that maybe one dollar given to the poorest people in the world is even worth more than a hundred times than giving money to, to a normal American, then it might be that you want to support random mister interventions. And nevertheless, yeah, because the effects of growth will come with a delay. Advocating for growth policy will come with a delay and at first only affect yeah, people who are richer in those countries. Yeah, that's really interesting. As our final question, do you think that growth is still sufficient for eliminating poverty when using more sophisticated poverty measures than just headcount rates? So poverty depth and poverty severity? Yes, I think this is just a matter of like how you measure things. And so, yeah, I still think that th this sort of like model holds. Yeah, I don't have much more to say about this. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, I feel like that's a good note to end on, that this is yeah. such a promising intervention. Thank you very much. This concludes the Q&A part of the session.